All right, so let's get started. Doppler echo uh, in uh, less than 15 minutes. So this is just really an overview. Uh, I understand most of you are first year, a couple of second year uh, cardiology fellows. So really the objectives in a short talk is to review the basic principles of cardiac ultrasound, talk a little bit about Doppler frequency shift, uh, demonstrate the use of Doppler methods to assess flow, to assess area, and to calculate pressures. So basically, you know, if, if you've either had your echo uh, first rotation or you're about to have it, uh, these are sort of the standard imaging echo planes for a transthoracic. And the reason we have all these planes is because with all these uh, two-dimensional slices, we're trying to capture a little bit of the segmental analysis of all of the ventricular walls. Uh, as a bit of a disclosure, transthoracic echo is extremely weighted towards the left ventricle and left-sided valves. Uh, that's not an accident, but you have to remember when you're reading echo and thinking echo, the right side uh, is usually underrepresented on a transthoracic echo, and early interpreters often have what I call a right-sided hemianopsia. You sort of forget to look at the right side. So it's there. You get glancing images of it uh, on most transthoracic views. But anyway, so these are the sort of the standard views, um, parasternal, apical, uh, and these are also, by and large, the views you have for Doppler. So this is really a Doppler talk. So I think you should know or you should review uh, the basic physics of ultrasound, um, but basically the, the, the 2D images are created by stitching together um, short bursts, and the, the wider those segments, the less resolution. We could have skip over that. So here we go. So this is basically the normal cardiac ultrasound at the top. So the, the system emits a high frequency um, burst of sound. That's the ultrasound into the tissue. The ultrasound is then transmitted into the body and reflected back. So the average speed of sound within the body is shown there, 1,540 meters per second. So that's, that's how the, all of the systems calculate uh, the depth of the structure it's hit by sort of estimating or knowing the speed of the, of the sound within the body. Then the system waits a given time for the pulse to come back to the transducer. So that's x is the time on the way to the, this, the object, 2x is the time back. And if there's a shift in terms of um, the frequency, then that suggests that the object that's being imaged is either moving away from the transducer or towards the transducer. And that's basically the principle of Doppler, is there a frequency shift by hitting an object. So this is just an example of a normal echo. And this is a prolapse here, and you can see a posterior leaflet prolapse. So this is the frequency I was just alluding to. So um, this is one second shown here, uh, a 10 megahertz. Basically, there's a lot of waves here. You can see the density of the waves is higher. This effectively gets you better resolution but lower penetration. So if you want uh, high spatial resolution, you want a, a lot of samples uh, of the subject in a short time frame. But you're not going to get very deep because high frequency does not penetrate far into tissues. On the other hand, lower frequency like 5 hertz gives you lower resolution, so there's less samples per unit time, but better penetration because the waves go farther. We all know radio waves go hundreds of kilometers, microwaves don't. So that's basically the basic principle of how you choose your probe. So if you're going to image a carotid artery, you choose high velocity, or sorry, a high frequency probe because you're not going very deep. If you're going to image uh, from the apex and try to see something at the posterior of the heart and you want to get 12 centimeters of depth, you're going to go low frequency. That's the basic principle in terms of how you choose your probes. Most probes are, are multi-frequency probes, so you can sort of dial up somewhere between 2 and 5 hertz per probe. But whether it's a transthoracic probe, a transesophageal probe, uh, you have to understand there is a concept that you can choose your frequency. Sometimes you're just choosing your, your depth and the, and the system will automatically adjust the frequency. But it's a basic principle of ultrasound is that the frequency matters. So shifting the Doppler frequency, this is the basic example. This is your probe. This is the frequency. And if you hit blood cells, and if the blood cells are moving towards the probe, uh, the frequency comes back higher. So that's a frequency shift up. Tells you the direction of the object you've hit is coming towards the probe. On the other hand, in the example on the bottom, the red blood cells are moving away from the probe. There's a frequency shift. The frequency becomes lower. So whether the frequency shifts up or down, tells you direction of the object that's being hit. And of course, this is one of the things important to know. Doppler was a person. He was a Mr. Doppler. So Doppler should always be capitalized. It's a proper surname. One of my pet peeves when people write Doppler with a small d. He's earned it. He should be capitalized. OK. So some of the Doppler applications. So this is what I was mentioning. So you get information about flow direction and flow velocity. 
So this is an example, red blood cells are hitting the probe, and what, the way that's displayed is with this velocity time map. So this is time across the bottom, this is the velocity of flow, so this is a spectrum, and this is a pulse wave Doppler. But the important part is the deflection is towards the probe because the blood, blood cells are moving towards the probe. On the other hand, this is blood flowing away from the probe, so it's inverted and it has a velocity profile that's moving away from the probe. It's very simple stuff, but the part of what you're doing in echo is you have to understand where the probe is in relation to the structures you're imaging to understand whether that flow is normal or abnormal. So depending on where you are, flow towards the probe is appropriate. If there's a regurgent lesion and the flow is away from the probe, that's obviously not appropriate. So you have to understand where, uh, that's why you all should be scanning to understand how these images are created. The other thing to understand is the, the quality of the flow is impacted and demonstrated by Doppler. So laminar flow, which is sort of the assumption for most flow with when it's not going through a valve, if it's going through a tubular structure like the left ventricular outflow tract, relatively tubular. The flow is supposed to look like this, we believe. This thing looks like a bug. It's actually a little symbol of a Fournier fast transform, but basically this is the flow. This is some magical computation. Uh, and, but the display, it looks like this. You sort of get a Doppler signal that's drawn, looks like it's drawn by a pencil. That means you've got a uniform velocity, uh, a population of velocities. So the velocities start here. They're all relatively similar all the way through this laminar flow sample, and it comes down like this. So whenever you're scanning and you're trying to, to put a pulse wave Doppler, you want to adjust the, app, the, uh, the software settings on the box so that you create a Doppler signal that looks like it's drawn by a pencil. That's the most uh, confident you'll be in the sample velocity. On the other hand, if you've got turbulent flow, for example, you're going through aortic stenosis, this is the way it projects. You have now a, a, a mixed population of velocities. It's not all going the same velocity. So you have some on the outside, you have some mid, uh, low, and high velocities. So you get this sort of uh, mess. But what this is, is a Doppler representation of turbulence and mixed velocities. So understand that Doppler also gives you an idea of the quality of the flow, not just the direction of flow and the absolute velocity of flow. Okay, so what are the applications for Doppler? Uh, the first one is to measure flow, and the second one is to measure pressure. So if you can measure flow, you can estimate uh, stroke volume and regurgitant volume. Uh, and if you measure pressure, you can assess then valve function, uh, and specific valve lesions, aortic stenosis, mitral stenosis, right ventricular systolic pressure. That's all based on the Doppler estimation of pressure. So here's the typical flow diagram. This is again, for example, the left ventricular outflow tract, a simple tube. You have this sort of a flat flow profile, uh, perhaps parabolic. It always slows down uh, where flow hits the edges of the vessel. There's some frictional forces and the velocity slows down. The velocities tend to be higher in the mid portion of the lumen. But in general, the math is simply the flow is the cross, I'm sorry, go back one if I can. Uh, the math is the cross-sectional area times the velocity. So that's how you get volume. It's area times, dis sorry, flow is uh, area times velocity. And then the flow volume is the cross-sectional area times the integration of the velocity. So the units here for cross-sectional area are typically centimeter squared. The time velocity integral, that's a Doppler concept. So that's from a, a pulse wave sample. And then what it does is this system will basically look at all the instantaneous velocities, integrate them, you integrate all those velocities over the known time, and that gives you the unit of distance. So the time velocity integral is distance. Distance times area equals volume. So that's essentially how you get volume by echo. This is an example of uh, a very common sort of workhorse in the echo lab. This is uh, left ventricular outflow tract diameter. This is the uh, apical view, pulsed wave Doppler placed in the LVOT. You measure the time velocity integral. So this is the trace. It looks kind of like it's drawn by a pencil, which is ideal. Stroke volume, cross-sectional area, times time velocity integral equals volume. So systemic stroke volume here shown here. So it doesn't have to be the LVOT. This is the mitral valve, the mitral annulus. So if you measure the diameter of the mitral annulus, and you assume it's a circle, whether that's right or wrong, but that's generally the math assumption is you assume it's a circle for the annulus. Um, this is the pulse wave sample at the annulus. You sort of trace it, you integrate it. So you have, again, an area times the distance equals a volume. So we can get left ventricular outflow volume. We can get mitral inflow volume. In an ideal situation, they should be the same volume. That's continuity of flow. What comes in the ventricle must leave the ventricle, provided there isn't MR, AR, 
a, uh, or a VSD. So this is one example of how you do a quantitation of mitral regurgitation using this volume calculation. So you can measure the mitral inflow, 120 milliliters. You measure the left ventricular outflow, 70 milliliters. The difference is 50 milliliters. So what that means is there's 50 milliliters that comes into the, an additional 50 milliliters that comes into the LV but doesn't leave the LV. So where does it go? It must be the regurgitant mitral volume. So that's the calculation, the Doppler stroke volume calculation of regurgitant volume. And, you know, that's the basic concept. You can do more things with that. So you can calculate, for example, the regurgitant aortic volume, aortic stroke volume, which is you measure the same way, the LVOT volume, minus the, syst uh, the systemic stroke volume, and the systemic could get somewhere else. Uh, it could be the mitral inflow, it could be the pulmonic, it could be an average of the mitral and pulmonic. As Dr. Shaw will probably tell you, by, by CMR, you can measure uh, systemic stroke volumes even in other places in the ascending aorta. But if you have the regurgitant volume, then you can calculate, for example, the regurgitant fraction. So this is sort of another concept, is you simply take that regurgitant volume and you divide it by the, the aortic stroke volume, and that difference is the regurgitant fraction. So it's one of the parameters of, uh, for the quantitation of regurgitant severity. And then you can take it a step further and even calculate the size of the regurgitant orifice, the effective regurgitant orifice area. Again, you're simply taking the regurgitant volume and you're dividing it by the time velocity integral of the regurgitant jet. So again, the concept is, you know, think through volume, area, distance. And if you understand what you're measuring, then you can, you can sort of not get lost in the math. So if you're trying to derive an area, you simply need to take a volume and divide it by a distance. And so these are the concepts important to understand with Doppler. So this is uh, an example uh, of calculating area now. This is usually the continuity equation. Again, we have an LVOT uh, diameter. Uh, we have an LVOT um, at time velocity integral. But then we have using continuous wave Doppler. So the one word on Doppler, pulse wave Doppler is range specific. It's a small sample volume. You know exactly where the velocity is coming from. Continuous wave Doppler samples velocity anywhere along the path of the Doppler beam. And you have to assume that you know where the highest velocity is. So if you're sampling, if you're shooting from the apex across the aortic valve, the assumption is the highest velocity is across the aortic valve because it's the narrowest point. That gets um, you know, difficult to do if there's a subaortic stenosis in addition to aortic uh, stenosis, so these things get, uh, there are caveats. But in general, the range specificity is the difference between pulse wave and continuous wave Doppler. Okay, so the continuity equation is simply, if you know the stroke volume on one side of the lesion, it must be the same stroke volume on the other side of the lesion. You know a bunch of these parameters, but the one you don't know is the valve area. You can derive the valve, you can derive the flow area uh, in the LVOT by the mechanism we've just mentioned. You can measure the velocity across the stenosis, but the area of the stenosis is really the unknown that you need to solve for, and that's the basic principle of the continuity equation. Flow on one side equals flow on the other side. You solve for the unknown area. The other way we measure uh, pressure is shown here. This is a, a contribution by uh, Mr. Bernoulli. Um, you've all seen this probably in physics at some point, but the change in pressure is this complex formula here where we have convective acceleration. You have uh, sort of an accounting of uh, flow, acceleration, and viscous friction. None of that really matters. You never need to know that, even on the echo boards. It's simply uh, the change in pressure is four times the velocity squared, provided the upstream velocity isn't too fast. So that's the one caveat. So if, if what we call V1, which is the velocity upstream, typically in the LVOT, as long as it's sort of 1 to 1.5, it's considered negligible. When you square that, it's still small. So, but if there's an acceleration below the LVOT and the, the LVOT velocity is maybe 2, or if there's a hyperdynamic state and the, the EF is 80%, and you've got an LVOT velocity of 2, then you square 2 and you multiply it by 4, it becomes not so negligible. So most of the time, the math is simply the change in pressure is four times the fastest velocity squared. And that works across the tricuspid valve uh, to estimate right ventricular systolic pressure. It works the vast majority of time across the aortic valve. It works across the mitral valve. Uh, so that's the number to know. So that's how we estimate pressure gradients. This is, again, uh, LVOT, stenotic aortic valve. Uh, this is the vena contracta, the narrowest portion of accelerated velocity distal to the orifice. Typically, just screening on an echo, any velocity over, four, over two meters per second, with the exception of mitral regurgitation, needs a little focus, needs a little attention. 
So pulmonic stenosis, uh, tricuspid regurgitation, mitral inflow. So as a general rule of thumb, if you see a velocity over two meters, unless it's MR, pay attention to figure out if that's normal or not. Um, but this is an example of AS. So very accelerated velocity, about five meters per second. So two meters is normal, four meters is severe, over four meters is more severe. Um, final uh, mention of Doppler is color Doppler. Color Doppler is, is really just um, pulse wave Doppler, okay? It's a, it's a parametric display of velocities. It does not mean flow by any stretch. Uh, it's direction dependent, just like I've shown you for all Doppler. So color Doppler is a par parametric display of velocities uh, and direction, um, but it does not indicate flow. And this is just one example of a 3D echo. This is looking from the apex up at the mitral valve. You see the mitral valve is open, anterior and posterior leaflet shown. Unfortunately, the aortic valve is also open. That's never a good scenario where both valves are open in systole. So this is functional at mitral regurgitation. The valve didn't close during systole when the aortic valve is open. And this is the very broad uh, color Doppler jet you know, showing severe mitral regurgitation. So in summary, we reviewed the principles of cardiac ultrasound, a little bit about Doppler frequency shift, demonstrated uh, fundamental use of Doppler is to assess flow, to derive stroke and regurgitation and volumes, calculate valve areas and pressure gradients. I'll stop there. Thanks. Uh...